I want you to hit me as hard as you can. She reinvented the romantic comedy for a new generation and dazzled the world with her unbelievable cuteness and remarkable talent. Meg Ryan was one of the biggest names in Tinseltown for a while, not only turning the rom-com into an art form, but she also tackled more dramatic material as well. And after a series of floppity flops, her career seemed to slow down a little bit, so slow that people started asking a very particular question. And that question is, what the f*** happened to Meg Ryan? WTF! But to truly understand what the f*** happened to Meg Ryan, we must start at the beginning. And the beginning began when she was born on her birthday in 1961. Connecticut. She went to college for journalism, but soon found success as an actress. So she joined SAG, the Screen Actors Guild, and changed her name, Meg Ryan. She, that was, that's, not her, that's not her birth name. Her birth name is, is something less interesting. I don't even remember it. That's how non-interesting it was. It wouldn't have looked good on a poster, they would say. But Meg Ryan, now that's a movie star name, I guess. Meg Ryan would make her acting debut in 1981 at the age of 18 years old in the film Rich and Famous. Then she took on a minor role in Amityville 3D. It scared you in three dimensions. And she also appeared in many commercials selling things like Burger King and toothpaste. She sells you the burger to eat and then your teeth get dirty and then she sells you the toothpaste to brush them. I'm on to you, Meg Ryan. Ra ra ra. Then Meg Ryan would appear in a daytime soap opera that's still running today, As the World Turns. She was on from 1982 to 1984, and she played Betsy Stewart, appearing in one of the show's biggest romantic storylines. And her character's wedding with Steve on May 30th, 1984, was an event that attracted over 20 million viewers. And it remains the second highest rated hour of American soap opera history. If I cared about soap operas, this would be really cool. Your love gives me strength and hope. And now with the people that we love all around us, I take you as my husband. Meg Ryan would then have that loving feeling as Goose's wife in Top Gun, a film that would go on to make over $360 million worldwide and remains Meg Ryan's highest grossing film. And she had some incredible chemistry with Goose, and it wasn't all just good acting, they actually started dating after the film. And yeah, Top Gun, it, it, it's great, because, you know, it's Top Gun. Then Meg Ryan would appear opposite comedy legends John Candy and Eugene Levy in the film Armed and Dangerous in 1986. And everybody hated this movie, even though everybody loves the cast. It's got a great cast. But just because you love the people in the movie don't mean you love the movie. It's a sad fact of life, and it's best that you just learn it now, kids. Then came 1987 with the film Inner Space. It's a great little film, and I do mean little, but it's also big. Meg Ryan would appear opposite Martin Short and Dennis Quaid in this film directed by Joe Dante that won an Oscar for visual effects. And Meg Ryan and Dennis Quaid would begin dating after this film, and it would uh, accumulate in a marriage on Valentine's Day 1991. Aw, so romantic. Until it wasn't. But yeah, back to Inner Space. The film actually had very positive reviews from the critics. They actually appreciated how insane the plot was. And everybody at the studio thought this was gonna be a mega blockbuster, but unfortunately, the film was not a financial success. But in later years, everyone has gone on to appreciate the mixture of science fiction and absurd comedy. <coughs> Then came the film Promised Land, and this powerful drama was actually the first film to be commissioned by the Sundance Film Festival, and her performance would be nominated for an Independent Spirit Award. So that's, that's cool, which got her some indie cred, which, you know, you always need a little bit of indie cred every now and then, but the film would fail to even make back half a million dollars theatrically. You know, that's what happens with independent films. They're not really known for, you know, making, uh, whatchamacallit, money. Then, in 1988 came D.O.A. Dead on Arrival. 
She would reunite with her soon-to-be husband, Dennis Quaid, for this thriller about a man who has 24 hours to find out who poisoned him. It's a loose remake of the 1949 film noir of the same name, and actually Crank with Jason Statham is a remake of the same movie, so you can kind of say this is Meg Ryan's Crank. And DOA, Dead on Arrival, was an apt title because it opened in third place and finished its theatrical run with only around $13 million, which uh, is, sounds like a lot of money to people who don't have $13 million, but for the, the fat cats in Holly Weird, it's just pennies, yo. Then came the Presidio. Presidio. Ryan would play Sean Connery's daughter in this good old-fashioned murder mystery from 1988. And the film generally received negative reviews, unfortunately, and would only go on to make $20 million, which, you know, pennies. You turned your back on her, too, I didn't you? I said stop that. You did it! You are a bastard! It was your fault! But then came the year 1989 and Harry met Sally in the film When Harry Met Sally. Now we get into prime Meg Ryan. That's right, this is one of her bests. Meg Ryan would receive her first Golden Globe nomination for her performance in this film. And yes, this movie is really, really great, but I think we all remember one particular scene in this movie. And that now infamous I'll Have What She's Having Seen was not in the original script. Believe it or not, it was actually Meg Ryan who suggested that they do the scene in a restaurant. And for her character not to just talk about faking it, but to actually fake it out loud, in public, around people who are eating. Meg Ryan. Oh. I'll have what she's having. The film was released in the summer of 1989, where it was feared to be lost amongst a plethora of big-budget summer blockbusters like Batman and Indiana Jones' The Last Crusade. But this little romantic comedy that could still went on to make a very healthy $93 million from a $16 million budget. And you can actually trace the success of When Harry Met Sally to good old-fashioned word of mouth. It's like tweeting, but like with your mouth. The film is credited with bringing back the romantic comedy into the mainstream. And critics were enamored with the chemistry of Ryan and Crystal. Good old Billy Crystal. You'll eventually fall in love with him after he bugs you for a whole movie. And to this day, the film is still a benchmark for how to make romantic comedies. And yes, everybody loves When Harry Met Sally, but I actually prefer this next film, Joe vs. the Volcano in 1990. And this was the first pairing of Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks. And it was not a paint-by-the-numbers romantic comedy, no, no, no. This is a highly stylized, wacky ride about a tale of a man with a fake disease on a journey of self-discovery. And along the way, he meets three very different women. And all three of these women are played by Meg Ryan for reasons that I don't really know or understand, but it's cool. What? Nice to meet you. Wow, what a change. The film received mixed reviews because stupid people didn't understand it. But yeah, Joe vs. the Volcano, it's wild, it's crazy, it's imaginative. You gotta check this one out. You will either love it or you will hate it. And those are the best kind of movies. The following year, 1991, she would play the girlfriend of Jim Morrison in the movie The Doors, directed by Oliver Stone. And as with any Oliver Stone movie, controversy surrounds the depiction of the characters and the events of this film. Some say that Oliver Stone took uh, liberties with certain facts. But hey, it's Oliver Stone, who cares? And even though Meg Ryan admitted to not being a huge Doors fan, she does a great job playing this out of control rocking chick. Once again, showing that she is more than just Sally. I know everything. I love it when you sing to me. That's because I'm the poet and you're my muse. Then came Prelude to a Kiss. Ryan would star in this stage adaptation, replacing the original actress, Mary Louise Parker, because the studio thought Meg Ryan would be more bankable at the time, and they were probably right. But the film had mixed reviews, and everybody said the play was better. And then, much to my surprise, she actually did a voice on Captain Planet and the Planeteers. For 13 episodes, she was Dr. Blight. 
I'm actually learning things. There you go, a nice paperweight. Just the thing to keep on your desk in prison. Ah! Then finally, Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks would reunite in Sleepless in Seattle. Rob Reiner directed this romantic comedy where the two people who fall in love don't even have a scene together or meet until the end of the movie. The last scene, actually. And this role was offered to pretty much every A-list actress at the time. People like Julia Roberts, Kim Basinger, Michelle Pfeiffer, Jennifer Jason Leigh, and Jodie Foster all declined the role. Then Meg Ryan came in there and took it. Critics were impressed with the comedy in the film and the chemistry that the two leads had, even though they only have two minutes of screen time actually together. But that shows how great they are. They don't even need to be in the same frame to feel the love. Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks would score Golden Globe nominations for this film, and Tom Hanks would win, not for this film, but for Philadelphia, and Meg Ryan would go on to win the funniest actress in a lead role at the American Comedy Awards that year. Then came the movie Flesh and Bone in 1993, and I guess at this time Meg Ryan really liked working with Dennis Quaid, her husband, and Meg Ryan jumped into this role just one week after completing Sleepless in Seattle. She's a hard-working woman, and that's what you gotta do to succeed in this biz. So I hear. And the film only made $10 million at the box office. Frickin' pennies. Then in 1994 came When a Man Loves a Woman. Meg Ryan would receive rave reviews and a Screen Actors Guild nomination for her performance as an alcoholic in this 1994 drama. And the film has mostly positive reviews, with Roger Ebert, who was a recovering alcoholic at the time, giving the film a rare four stars. And he said that he could not find a false note in Meg Ryan's performance. I think Roger Ebert is Meg Ryan's number one fan. And the film actually did decently at the box office, making $50 million. Then came a movie called IQ. And I think it's a romantic comedy, and I think Albert Einstein's in it, and I think that's kind of creepy because, like, didn't he marry his cousin or something? I don't know. The film did horrible at the box office. Then there was a movie called French Kiss, and this was the first film produced by Meg Ryan. That's right, she's not only an actress, she is a producer too. Ryan would again be nominated for an American Comedy Award for Funniest Actress in a Motion Picture for this comedic tale about a woman and the thief she falls in love with. Then there was a movie called Restoration in 1995. It was set during a plague, and nothing is more romantic than a plague. The film won two Academy Awards for Best Art Direction and Best Costume Design, but Meg Ryan had nothing to do with that. And critics actually liked the film a lot, but they said that Meg Ryan was unfortunately miscast in this period piece. Then came the film Courage Under Fire in 1996. Meg Ryan would defy expectations, taking on the role of an army captain and helicopter pilot who saved the lives of many others while her chopper was going down. The film has a stellar cast with people like Denzel Washington, and critics felt that the film had Oscar-caliber performances from everybody involved, with some, I'd say, disrespectfully saying that they were surprised at how good Meg Ryan was. And I get it, I know that she's mostly known for silly romantic comedies, but that doesn't mean that the girl can't act. They didn't think that she could pull off this performance, and you know what, she showed them. Because I guess the critics never really appreciated her. And no matter how many of these gritty, dramatic performances she would turn out, they would still see her as the, you know, the, the cute little blondie who giggles next to Tom Hanks. It's like, no, Meg's got some power behind her. She's not just Meg, she's a, like a frickin' Megalodon, if you know what I'm saying. And how dare they disrespect this woman. <clears throat> but yeah, back to Courage Under Fire. It uh, would pull in uh, $100 million worldwide, so that's good. Good job, Meg. Then came a movie called Addicted to Love. Or as I like to call it, When Ferris Met Sally. I haven't seen Addicted to Love because in 1997 I was too busy watching Anastasia. And speaking of Anastasia, Meg Ryan's in it. She's Anastasia, or the woman who's pretending to be Anastasia, who actually ended up in real life not being Anastasia, but let's not talk about that, let's not ruin the magic of Anastasia. Her voice would team up with John Cusack and Christopher Lloyd for the first ever film produced under the 20th Century Fox's new animation division. That's right, this is not a Disney movie, I repeat, this is not a Disney movie yet. And Anastasia was a big commercial and critical hit, making just shy of $140 million. And Meg Ryan did not sign on immediately for the role, 
She needed some convincing, so the studio actually took audio from Sleepless in Seattle and set it to animation from the film. And Ryan was so impressed that shortly after she signed on to play this animated princess poser. In all my life, I have been correcting people whenever they reference Anastasia as a Disney princess. I would jump into the conversation and pretentiously state that actually Anastasia was produced by Fox. So she is not officially a Disney princess. Until recently, when Disney bought Fox, so actually Anastasia is now a Disney princess, so congratulations, Meg Ryan. You are now a Disney princess. Or your, your voice is. And to be a Disney princess is everyone's dream. But sure, yeah, I guess every lonely girl would hope she's a princess. And somewhere, one little girl is. And it's also everyone's dream to fall in love with Nicolas Cage, and Meg Ryan did just that in City of Angels. She was nominated for the oh-so-prestigious Blockbuster Entertainment Award for Favorite Actress. And many critics praised Meg Ryan's performance, some calling it her best yet. But they said the film was a little too formulaic. City of Angels was a huge hit, making over $200 million worldwide. Then came a movie called Hurley Burley. And it's just fun to say that title, Hurley Burley, Hurley Burley. Ryan would be featured in this ensemble film about a very popular stage play of the same name, and that name is Hurley Burley. Hurley Burley. Then there was You Got Mail. Ryan would reunite with her sleepless and Seattle lover, Tom Hanks. Yes, You've Got Mail. It's a film that's so outdated, even its title is outdated. Is AOL even still a thing anymore? <laughs> like, like, this is a movie about two people who met online. Oh, wow. What a wild concept. And actually, it, it was a wild concept for 1998. So if you ever want to go back and look at how silly 1998 was, watch You've Got Mail. Meg Ryan was actually nominated for the glorious Golden Globe for this performance in this film, You've Got Mail. And aside from her supporting role in Top Gun, which doesn't really count, this is Meg Ryan's highest grossing film, pulling in 250 million buckaroos. And, and what, what more can I say? It's a movie starring Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. And even if the movie sucks, which it doesn't, it's still gonna be charming because those two were just made for each other on screen. But yeah, Tom Hanks plus Meg Ryan equals watchable movie. Then came 2000 AD, the new millennium, the Y2K time. She made a comedy called Hanging Up, and somehow this comedy cost $60 million to make, and it only made back $51 million. Aww. Then came the movie Proof of Life, which actually interfered with Meg Ryan's real life. Yes, that's right, real life has a way of balancing things out. On screen, Meg Ryan would ditch the romantic roles she was known for, but off screen, her romantic life was making headlines. Because things were kind of getting hot and spicy between her and her co-star, Russell Crowe, while she was still married to Dennis Quaid. <gasps> Gasp! But critics were not really impressed with this one, calling it a by-the-numbers thriller, and saying that the two leads lacked chemistry. But I guess Dennis Quaid would disagree with that. And the film was nothing new or original. But Ryan received a hefty $15 million paycheck for this one. That's proof of something. And many people believe that the rumors of the extramarital affair hurt Meg Ryan's career. The general public seemed to be upset with what they thought they knew about Meg Ryan's personal life. They were like, how could you? Poor Dennis Quaid! But hold your horses, ladies and gentlemen. Dennis Quaid ain't exactly innocent in this case either. There was plenty of backlash and even some scarlet letter women shaming type stuff going on. You can never really win in the, in the way a tabloid tells a story. It's a very black and white, very overly simplistic moral universe that certain st people's stories are supposed to fit in. Yeah. And they don't. But Proof of Life failed to recoup its $65 million budget, pulling in just $62 million worldwide. And the director Taylor Hackford blamed the failure of the film on the off-screen behavior of his actors. And Meg Ryan actually publicly responded to this, calling Taylor Hackford a f***ing idiot. 
Then there was Kate and Leopold in the year 2001. This story tells of a man who creates a time portal that teleports his great-great-grandfather from the 19th century to the present day, 2001. And then his great-great-grandfather falls for his ex-girlfriend. It's a classic love story, you know, that age-old tale. The film was heavily censored just days before its theatrical release because a few critics found it a bit sick because, uh, spoiler alerts for Kate and Leopold, if, if you care. Ultimately, Meg Ryan's character Kate goes back to the year 1876 and ends up marrying Leopold, thus meaning that in the present day, the character Stuart, Meg Ryan's ex-boyfriend, was having a relationship with his great-great-grandmother. I don't know about you, but uh, that's a big no. So they chopped all that up and uh, tried to make sense of the movie. The Blu-ray release of the film actually has the director's cut in all of its incestuous glory. If you're into that kind of stuff, you probably shouldn't be. And the film was actually a modest success, pulling in $76 million worldwide. But critics and audiences seem to be split right down the middle on this one, appreciating the chemistry between the two leads. But, you know, they couldn't really get past the bland time travel love story plot. It lacked logic and was kind of disgusting. And I'm going to be honest with you guys, this is actually the last Meg Ryan movie I've ever seen. That's right, I have not watched a new Meg Ryan movie in 20 years. That's two decades without Meg Ryan. How have I made it? You ask? Well, you know, it, it was tough, but gonna pull through, don't worry. But that doesn't mean that Meg Ryan stopped working. No, she made lots of stuff that I just didn't watch. Like the movie In the Cut in 2003. And it seems like post Y2K Meg Ryan was trying to break free of her squeaky clean image. And she started taking on more daring roles, such as this erotic thriller. And yeah, I haven't seen this movie, but I did a quick scroll through, you know, to edit this thing and and yeah it's a uh, it's a uh, pretty raunchy you get to see Harry meeting Sally if you know what I mean critics applauded Meg Ryan's performance and her willingness to step out of her comfort zone but they ultimately found the movie boring and pointless and it's it's always good if your movie has a point and isn't boring so I hear the audiences seem to agree with this nobody went to go see it and only made five million dollars which you know that's just some pennies and it got a rare F rating on its cinema score. An F for a f***ing failure. Sorry. I haven't seen it. Maybe it's good. I, I don't think I'm allowed to watch it, though. Then, when Meg Ryan's career was Against the Ropes, she went and did a movie called Against the Ropes in 2004. Ryan would take on the true life tale of the world's first successful female boxing promoter slash manager. The film was a massive box office bomb, grossing just $6.6 .6 million from a $39 million budget. Yikes. I actually have followed her television career, apparently, because she had wonderful guest spots on The Simpsons and Curb Your Enthusiasm, both being hilarious. And she's a perfect fit for both of those amazing television shows. Then there was a movie called In the Land of Women, where Meg would continue her streak of underperforming films with this movie that grossed less than $20 million. Then came the year 2008, where she would find herself in two, count them, two direct-to-video movies. Ouch. First was the movie The Deal with William H. Macy, who she had no chemistry with. And then there was My Mom's New Boyfriend with Antonio Banderas, who she also had no chemistry with. Then there was the movie The Women. Yeah. And this movie would actually get Meg Ryan her first Razzie nomination. Ouch. For Worst Actress, but the upside of this nomination is that she would share it with every other actress in the movie. Everybody was horrible. Together. Girl power. Then 2009 brought us a movie called Serious Moonlight. And the film was a critical and commercial flop. Critics were calling it a jumbled mess. And I don't like my movies to be a jumbled mess. 
and the film failed to even make half a million dollars at the box office. That's like half a penny. Then she was in something called Web Therapy. She would appear in a couple episodes. It's a funny short form series from Lisa Kudrow. She's funny. Then Meg Ryan would try to follow in the footsteps of Bob Saget as the narrator for How I Met Your Dad, a spinoff of How I Met Your Mother. But this one was not a huge success. It actually didn't even get picked up. Yeah, the network ended up passing on the show, thus ending a possible huge comeback for Meg. Then she had a small role in an ABC family film called Fangirl, playing the lead character's mother, and the ads call this thing an insta-comedy, whatever that is, about a hashtag superfan. That's so hashtag 2015. Speaking of hashtag 2015, that was the year when Meg Ryan would step into the director's chair, or sit into the director's chair, I guess you don't step into, you, she sat down in the director's chair, to direct Ithaca. She would take the plunge into directing this World War II era drama, but the film has a low 31% score on those tomatoes that are rotten, which is kind of disappointing for Meg Ryan's first outing as a director. There will always be pain in this world, Homer, and a good man will seek to take the pain out of things. And Meg Ryan really hasn't directed a film since 2015, and I hope the low score didn't scare her away from the director's chair, because even the best directors, you know, they, they get a slow start. So I say give it another try, Meg Ryan. I know, I know you got some directing talent in you. Let's see what you got next. <laughs> <laughs> this lovely actress rose to power by being the go-to woman for romantic comedies that to this day remain the linchpins of the genre. Every other rom-com actress since Meg Ryan has just been trying to live up to Meg Ryan. And I'm sorry, ladies, but you can't. But she has proven to be far more than just a rom-com queen. She's like a legit actress, you guys. Seriously. Throughout her career, she continuously challenged herself by tackling difficult roles that didn't always light up the box office, which seemed to suit her just fine as she started to enjoy her time away from Hollywood raising a family. And I know this is a hard truth to swallow, guys, but family is more important than movies. And I am so proud of Meg Ryan. She has risen above the judgment that comes from being a woman of a certain age, especially in Holly Weird. And she has fully embraced the next stage of her life and career. No regrets, no looking back. Even though she has a lot of good films to look back on. Oh, God. Oh. In addition to being wrongfully portrayed by the media, fake news, she learned not to care about people's opinions and just did her own thing. You go, Meg. Girl. Power. And Ryan said that making her directorial debut, Ithaca, actually reignited her passions for cinema. And yes, it's been a few years since she's directed a film. Perhaps she is just waiting for that perfect project that will remind the world why we all fell in love with her in the first place. I, for one, cannot wait to see what she comes up with next. And that is what the f*** happened to Meg Ryan. Thank you for watching our show. If you like what you see, please subscribe to our Joe Blow Videos channel. Tell your friends who like this sort of content and turn on the bell to receive notifications for all our latest videos. We're an independent company and we appreciate all your support.